following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Exodus. The title of this lecture is a very Kabbalistic and alchemical. Going directly into ourselves, we are going to see how this uh, Exodus, which in Hebrew is called Shemoth, is precisely different clues, alchemical mysteries written in order to guide those who want to enter into the Exodus. As you can see in the first graphic, Shemoth means names. Shem in Hebrew is name. So Shemoth is plural. And since it's ending with the letters Vav and Tav is pointing us that this exodus relates to Malkut, which is, of course, uh, in Hebrew, Mizrahim, a word that we are going to study profoundly because it is related with what we see in this graphic, the waters and the path in the midst of the waters. This is something very important that uh, we can see in the word Shemoth. If we place the letter Mem first, in the letter Shin, second, in the Hebrew language, then we read Moshath. Why are we doing this? Because you know that uh, the one that, according to the Bible, guides all the Israelites in the Exodus is Moshe. And Mem Shin, He, which is the letter that symbolizes the world of Malkut, Moshe, means the one that is born from the waters. According to the Bible. So that's why when we read the, the name in Hebrew, Shemoth, we can say also Moshoth. 
in order to comprehend that relates to the different names, Shemoth, different names, plural, that relates to Moses. This is how you see in this anagram in the first uh, graphic that we are looking in our lecture. So Shemoth names relates to the different Kabbalistic alchemical names that are hidden within the Bible. As you see, every time that we give a lecture related with the Bible, we always go into these mysterious names that could be deciphered only Kabbalistically, alchemically. Because this is how the masters, in this case Moshe, the one that wrote the first books of the Bible, and caught it. We had to state that Moshe put the spirit that vivifies the word behind the word. So when people read the Bible, translated into different languages, since they don't see the spirit that vivifies the word, they only uh, explain that literally. But we see the spirit that vivifies the word. That's why Shemoth names relate to all of those different names that we have to develop, which are the archetypes that each one of us received uh, internally. So Shemoth or Exodus is of course the departure of these uh, archetypes from our physicality which is called Mizraim, Egypt, into the promised land, which is something esoteric. It has nothing to do uh, with anything physical. In the point of, from the point of view that people think that Moses went into Egypt and took a lot of people there and put it into the Middle East. We have to learn how to see the things esoterically. And for that, we have to put our place, ourselves, in the place of these archetypes in order to understand. To begin, let us go into the second graphic. And we find here what the Master Samael wrote in relation with the alchemist, who is the one that enters into this mysterious exodus in order to perform all the marvels that we see written in the book of Moses. We took Buddhism in order to explain the Master Samael on the earth states, the alchemist who does not sacrifice himself for humanity will never become a bodhisattva. And after that, he says, only the bodhisattva with bodhicitta, compassionate heart, who have given their life for humanity, can incarnate the intimate Christ. Of course, as you can see there, read, at the very end, Matthew Samael on the earth states that Madame Blavatsky conventionally referred to Bodhisattva all of those who possess the superior existential bodies of the being, or better said, mercurial bodies. However, in a strict Orthodox Buddhism, only those who have the bodhicitta in themselves and who have renounced to all nirvanic happiness, for the love of humanity, 
can qualify themselves as bodhisattvas. When we study the tree of life, we arrive at the conclusion that uh, Tiferes, who is exactly in the middle of the tree of life, is a human soul who is precisely between the spirit and the matter. The forces of matter relates to Netzah, Hod, Yasod, and Malkut, the four inferior Sephiroth, and the spirit to Geburah, Hesed, Bina, Chokmah, and Keter, above. So Tifereth is the center. And according to the Zohar, Tifereth is Jacob. Jacob, who is the sole breath, according to alchemy, of Isaac, or called the son of Isaac. Isaac is Geburah, where we find Neshama, the spiritual soul that we need to develop or that we need to be in contact with. When we make that contact with Neshama, Geburah, then uh, we enter into the level of Jacob, because a breath, a soul breath, detached from Isaac, and that soul breath is the one that descends into Malkut. As you know, the book of Genesis describes how Jacob married four women and have 12 tribes which is an allegory. Those four wives represent the four rivers of Eden, or the four waters with which the alchemist has to work with. We, in many lectures, uh, state that in our physicality, which is called Mizrahim, we have those waters. The cerebral spinal fluid and the sexual fluid called semen. In the man, that's called the river Pishon and Gihon. And in the woman, it's called the river Herikel and Euphrates. So when we unite those waters in sexual alchemy, then we are working with the four wives of Jacob. We, as soul breath, meaning as essences. And this is how we understand how, uh, by working seriously in alchemy, those archetypes that are called the 12 tribes of Israel descend into our physicality which the Bible call, or is translated as Egypt. But really, if you read the Bible, is uh, in Hebrew, is Mizrahim. Which is a very interesting word that we are going to see little by little in order to comprehend what we are looking or reading the Exodus. That is not something that happen to many people, but individually, if you work in alchemy. And if you count that person with another person that work individually with that or with those rules of alchemy, and then if we unite them, we make a large people, amount of people. But each one of them is a subject that is working internally with these archetypes that we are naming and that we are going to explain little by little. Here again, 
you see in the third graphic, we find the word Exodus. And in the bottom, we find the word Israel. And the word Mizrahim that we are addressing. If we disclose this Mizrahim and place it according to the cross of sexual alchemy, because the cross is the union of the two waters, the two rivers, the man and the woman, you find that by disarranging the word Mizrahim Kabbalistically, and then you put in each side of Israel, that is the one that represents the one that is living in Egypt, or what the people call the people of Israel or the archetypes of Israel, you find that Maim or Maim, Maim means in Hebrew waters and relates, of course, to the tree of life. Because the tree of life has three columns. The right column is the water related to the man. And the left column is the water related to the woman, who are working with the Shakti potential, with the seed, which is Yad. The letter Yad is always the first letter of the holy name of God, yod He vav He, because Yad is the, is the seed, the Shakti potential. The first element that appears from the abstract, absolute space in order to create the universe, any universe. So that's why we put that Shakti potential in the spinal column of Israel. And by placing that, we form the word Maim, which means waters, the four waters of the, of the rivers of Eden. And in the middle, you find the other letters, the letter Resh, which means Rosh, head, and the letter Zadi, in the sexual glands, because Zadi, Zadik, means chaste, righteous. In order to enter into this exodus, you have to be a righteous. And by placing the Zadi letter in the sex and the resh in the head, by following the path between the two waters, we find the way, the path. That path is the zir, zir, which in Hebrew is written with Zadi, Yod, and Resh and means rakis, the spinal rakis, the spinal column. So the word Mizrahim, alchemically, is showing us that we have to divide the waters from the waters. The waters from the right, the men, from the waters of the left, in order to go into the middle, our spinal column. And this is how we live, Mizrahim, which is our physicality, where everybody is a slave of the elements, of the forces, of matter. Because what we call evil is just the limitation of perception. And what is that that perceives? It is the soul, the consciousness. So as, as long as we have limitation in order to perceive through the senses, 
the truth, we are not seeing what is the truth. But also parts of it. And that's why we need to work with the waters in our spine in order to little by little to awake. Awaken the seven chakras or the seven senses of the spirit, the soul, along with the five senses of the physical body, we develop the 12 fruits of the tree of life, which is the rakis. This is how you understand Exodus. If you don't understand that you had to leave Mizrahim, Egypt, and that you are that physically, in order to enter into towards the promised land, you're just wasting your time. Because everything that is written in the Bible indicates that it's something completely individual. As we read the first chapter of Exodus, first verse, it states, and these are the names of the children of Israel who came into Mizraim, knowing that Mizraim is our physicality. So they are explaining these are the way in which those names, those archetypes came into our physicality. But that is written in the beginning of the second book, after the book of Genesis. So it's obvious that we want to know how did they come into Mizrahim? knowing that Mizrahim symbolizes the two waters in our physicality and the spinal column. How these archetypes descend into us? Well, we have to go then into the book of Genesis and to explain that. To begin, let us read what the verse, chapter 1 and verse 1 states. There are many translations. But when we read this, ish, this word, that means one, not many. It says, a man and his household came into Mizrahim. That is, you see, and his household came. It doesn't say that the whole town or the whole family it says a man. In order to indicate that it's all the archetypes that descend from the higher worlds into our physicality through Genesis. And here we find in the right the 12 tribes of Israel related with the 12 zodiacal signs. And it is because that soul breath that we call Jacob, Kabbalistically, has to gather, as you know, as the book of Genesis explains, he gathers all of those archetypes as his family. Because all of them are children of Jacob. With the four women that represent the four rivers of Eden. Related with sexuality. So if we read that alchemically and Kabbalistically, we read, and this is how Jacob, a man with his archetypes, went down into our physicality, into Mizrahim. So, the mystery here is to know how to bring those archetypes. And that is only possible through initiation, by knowing alchemy. Here, we have placed in the next graphic 
the word Mizrahim divided into words, waters and zir, rakis. In order to understand that Malkut, the physical body, who is called the kingdom, is the one that receives that force. And that Israel relates the name Israel to three aspects that all of us have to understand. The first letter of the name Israel begins with Yad. The letter Yad represents the Shakti potential of the abstract absolute space that Kabbalah calls the Ein Sof. Here we have the Ein Sof beyond Keter. Each one of us has his own Ein Sof, that Yad. But that Yad contains within three other Yads which are represented in the second letter of the name Israel, which is Shin. So Shin is the symbol of fire. And if we place that Shin inside the Ein Sof, then we have four Yads. which are all manifested. And those four jazz are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the letter Yad that represents the Ein Sof. These four jazz are the Tetragrammaton. Yod, hey, vav, hey, Kabbalistically speaking. And that's why that is the secret name of God. The sacred and secret name of God. Because it also relates with the Ein Sof. When that Ein Sof, with that three particles, wants to develop, they need to create. So they emanate from themselves a ray. That ray penetrates into the letter Resh, which is Rosh, the head of the universe, and which the Egyptians call Ra, the Logos. Or what in other lectures we call the Teomertma Logos which are those cosmo creators that already have the three elements of the Trinity already developed. So they have the ability to help those unconscious rays that emanate for the first time and that appear into the universe. And that's why Rosh, the head, is symbolized by what we call the Father who is in heaven. Or the famous prayer of the Lord. Our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That kingdom is established in Ra, the Logos which the Book of Revelation calls the seven spirits behind the throne of God. Each spirit has a power of creation. And in order to help, they mix the three primary forces that already have the experience of creation with the three primary forces of the absolute making the word Esh, which is fire. That mixture 
of these three forces of our own particular reigns off with the Logos, the head of the universe, gives birth what we call the spirit inside of us. Lamed is the last letter of the word Israel. Lamed means, Kabbalistically, a heart that knows knowledge because it's connected. So that is what the word Israel means. That's why the letter Lamed represents the very bottom the heart that rises to what we call calf here in the top of our head and rises as a tower with the letter Yad on top. That means that that knowledge that we have and we develop, we receive it through the Yad into our head and place it in the heart. That is Lamed. The heart, as you can see, relates again to Tifereth. And the spirit is what we call Hesed, who is mercy. Hesed, mercy, is our innermost. The Bible call it Abraham because this is how those archetypes enter for the first time into our own particularity, which is Hesed, the spirit. That is the monad that we call or name in many lectures, our own particular unity. When we pray to our monad, our inner God, our innermost, we know that beyond that monad, the innermost, the three primary forces abide. You see, above Chesed, we find Chokhmah, Bina, and Keter, which represents the three primary forces, all manifested and manifested. Thanks to the action of the Logos that connect them. The Logos is also called Christ. That's why Christ incarnated in the body of Jesus of Nazareth said, no one goes to the Father but through me. We are not talking about the personality of Jesus of Nazareth, but Christ, which is not a person, but an energy that was incarnated in Jesus and teaching that. But Christ incarnated in many other masters, incarnated in Buddha, incarnated in Moses, incarnated in Krishna, etc. So, this is how Israel enters for the first time into Hesed. And the way to understand this is by looking at this graphic of the Hindu pantheon, where the Logos, represented by Vishnu, has as a crown 12 serpents that represent those 12 archetypes that eventually will descend in each one of us into our physicality, thanks to the actions of the matter, or the abstract forces of the matter that in this case represents the wife, Lakshmi, the wife of Vishnu. And in the umbilical cord, on top of it, you find the god Brahma. This uh, Hindu 
archetype appeared before the Hebrew archetypes. Brahma, by putting the A at the end of that word in the beginning, then is no longer Brahma, but Abraham. At the same letters. Abraham, he said, is Hesed. And Hesed is the outcome of the Logos. Then we have how the book of Genesis starts. Bereshit bera Elohim ad ha shamayim ve'at ha'aretz. Which means, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. By studying each word as an anagram, we find Baresh, the son of fire, the it, which is precisely the yad with the cross, because the letter Tav represents the cross. And that's why they said that Saturn took the universe from the chaos or from Uranus in order to make the universe. And that Uranus, or I mean that uh, Saturn, represents the letter Tav. You see the symbol of, of, uh, of Saturn is the cross with the serpent in the bottom. Remember the, arc, the astrological symbol of Saturn. That is the cross of Otav, together with the Yod. Meaning that through the works of the Holy Spirit, which is Saturn, the Son of Fire descends. And that Son of Fire is Israel. Of all the archetypes. And after that, Bara Elohim is disclosed as Bar Elohim. And that's Bar Elohim is the Logos, the son of Elohim, which is that cognizance that emerges from the abstract, absolute space. And after that says, Thou the names, Ata Shemim. In this case, Shem is multiplied by the, the, the word or the letter Yod and Mem, which means masculine. Above, the names are masculine, and below they are feminine. You see how the mixture of the forces are? Shemim. The names in heaven descend and become Shemot. In Malkut. Shemim and Shemot are the same archetypes. Shemim in heaven are what we call the Zodiac. By descending into Malkut, they become Shemoth. And this is something that we have to see in order to comprehend. And thou, the earth, of course, is our physicality. That we are explaining here that those Shemim or names descend into Malkut, the earth, in order to become Shemoth. If we analyze that in that way, we comprehend that those archetypes need to descend into matter in order to develop. Because God, or we will say the city in the absolute, the ends of, has a power of happiness. But they don't know how to comprehend their own happiness. 
So they need to descend into the matter and to develop that in order to return with knowledge. By returning, then we have what we call an inhabitant of the absolute. But for that, the archetypes have to descend. How do they descend? Through initiation. So, the first uh, step that we are studying, which is the descent of those archetypes from the absolute into our physicality, is called exile or diaspora. Or very diaspora is how you say it. Diaspora means dispersion. So do not mistake exile with exodus. It's a completely different. Exile, diaspora, is the descent of the archetypes through the tree of life, as we explain from the abstract absolute space to the first trinity into El, which is Abraham, Hesed, and then into Geburah, down, into Malkut. And this is what we read in the book of Genesis, that the forces of above Talk to Abraham, which is, in this case, El, because that is the name, you see now, talking about Shemim and Shemoth, names. El is the male, Shem, the male name of Abraham in the world of archetypes. And his wife who is his half-sister, is Sarai. Which is Neshama, the spiritual soul, the breath of God. Because in Neshama, the breath of God, is where these archetypes descend. So that's why we find in the book of Genesis, that the wife of Abraham, who is El, in a archetype, is married with Sarai. If you place this Sarai with El together, you form Israel. Israel. Moses hides that very smartly. For the people to get lost in history and all of that. But ultimately, no, we don't get lost. We know that Abraham and Zarai are the archetypes that need to descend into Mizraim. And that's why the Logos said, Get out of your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you that was given to Abraham. If you read this literally, you may think, oh, well, he was living in one country and left that country and went into another country. This is how people understand that. In that case, everybody here is Abraham because everybody is coming from another country, from Europe, from Asia, from South America. So we did it, right? No. <laughs> That is not the meaning of it. The meaning is that this Israel, which is the monad, because Hesed and Geburah formed the monad, had to abandon all of that that we, we said, country, relatives, father's house, family, your land, meaning 
that the monad in his journey through the kingdoms, mineral, plant, animal kingdoms, always form a type of relationship, attachment with those kingdoms. And when they enter for the first time into the humanoid kingdom, they continue with those habits, which are animal. All of us, as while we state, we are intellectual animals, humanoids. We are so attached to our family, to our race, to our country, and we make divisions. Why? Because still we don't abandon the country, our relatives, our family. But that doesn't mean, as I said in the beginning, that you are going to abandon your family and go to another country. No. That means psychologically to eliminate even living with your father and mother and your relatives, uncles, cousins, aunts. Even living with them, you have to cut that attachment and to little by little to be detached, to enter into the human level. Because as long as you are very attached to those blood races and psychological stuff that people have in this day and age, very much strong, you are in Mizrahim, in the level of humanoid, intellectual animal. Because the human being is the human being, and the intellectual animal is completely different. You have to develop that. In order to develop that, you need to develop your soul, your psyche. And that's precisely what the Sohar explains that. That Abraham leaves his country, of course, veiled. But he says, and going to Egypt, because at that time, Egypt was the land where they found the secret doctrine. And this is how Abraham, El, the innermost, received the nine initiations of lesser mysteries. And after that, he received the higher initiations. Of course, this is something that we always advise to everybody. We say in our lectures that we are unveiling all of this for people in order for them to enter into the Exodus. But they had to learn, as Master Samael Onveor stated in his lectures. He said, we are going to make three selections for the Exodus. The first selection will be for those that enter into the path, for those that receive the doctrine and practice it. That's the first election. And in order to enter into that, you have to enter into the book of Genesis. You have to generate. You have to imitate Abraham. And you have to pray. That's why we always advise. Begin with praying. Because the tree of life is showing you that all the great patriarchs of the Bible descend into Malkut in order to start. Abraham is the one that receives the lesser mysteries, which are nine degrees related with the inner layers of Klippoth, in which you have to fight against your defects and vices. You see here beneath Malkut are very nine dark layers, which Dante Alighieri describes beautifully in his Divine Comedy. We have to descend there because we have connections with Klippoth, which in English is called hell or inferno. 
subconsciousness, infraconsciousness, and consciousness. It's here. It's not outside, it's inside you. In the same way that we have physically living here and we meet other people as well, psychological, if we are in hell, we meet people that live in hell, like all of us. But if we enter into the mysteries, we start living Malkut, but through initiation. This is what the Zohar states, and this is how the Bible states. And what the Master explains, a divine ray exists within the human being. This divine ray wants to return towards his own star that has always been smiling upon it. This star which guides our interior is a superior divine atom from the after absolute space. The Kabbalistic name of this atom is the sacred Ein Sof, that we explained already. And at the very end, he says, this is the way in which the instinctive forces of nature trapped the innocent mind of the human being, so the false marriage of desire emerged and the eye continue reincarnating in order to satisfy its desires. Thus, we remain submitted to the law of evolution and karma. This is how we are right now. Submitted to the law of evolution and karma. So, understand that in order to comprehend what is the exile, the diaspora, or diaspora. Not fall into the mistake that is just a certain group of people. This is related with the soul, with the spirit. Physically, everybody experiences exile in different ways, different times. The First World War, Second World War, and these times, everybody is going from here to this other place in exile and looking for refuge. But we have to understand that all of us as souls are here in exile. And we need to return to our spirit in order to comprehend that. And this is what we call the diaspora. After we understand the diaspora and perform what the diaspora demands, then we can go into the exodus. It is erroneous to call exodus from the absolute because it's not. It's exile, diaspora. Exodus only happens from Malkut towards the higher plains. As you see in this graphic, the law of uh, reoccurrence, or what the people call reincarnation and return, is what we are submitted. Gaining experience life after life, but we need to sit down and meditate and to comprehend that in order to return with wisdom. And that's precisely the path of initiation. That's why the first step that Abraham did, the Bible talks that he had a son with Agar, the slave. Hagar, the slave, had a child with Abraham whose name was Ishmael. But from above says, no, you are mistaken, misunderstanding what I'm saying, that we need your a son. But it's not physical. It's something that Sarai has to give you. And it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual soul, the Nishama. And when he understands that, he enters into hay, which is the mysteries of alchemy, and then receives the hay, and is no longer Abraham, but Abraham. And his wife no longer is Sarai, but Sarah, because the ones are, the ones are working with alchemy. And they engender Isaac. This Isaac relates to the first initiation of major mysteries. 
that the spirit absorbs from Geburah. And this is how uh, those archetypes for the first time enter into Malkut and leave Malkut to Geburah. And then a master is born. A master alchemist. This master alchemist is called uh, alchemically Misrahi. There are certain Jews there that call themselves Misrahim because they are from Egypt. But Kabbalistic alchemically Misrahim or the group of people, the Misrahi, is the one that enters into the path, into the initi initiation, and to start developing the mysteries of Misrahim within which is, as you see, the two waters with the spinal column. The work of alchemy. That two waters with the spinal column, in other words, in Genesis, is called the tree of good and evil. Same meaning. It's a sexual mystery. So, as you see here, Experiences and pain complicated the eye. For evolution is nothing more than a process of the complication of energy. We will say it, complication of the spirit. Because when the spirit enters into the matter, he reduces himself to the limits of matter. And that's why that matter is called evil. Because we as soul cannot perceive beyond our matter. Initiation means to enter into the path and only to develop the consciousness and to perceive beyond our individuality. To perceive the absolute <coughs> or what Buddhism calls to develop bodhicitta. That bodhicitta is a soul breath. The Detached from Neshama, from Isaac, and whose name is Jacob. That Jacob had to be very sly in order to know how to develop those archetypes. And that's why Jacob is related with Tifereth, the human soul. But they need to descend into Malkut in order to develop that Borichita. Compassion, heart. Everybody has that capacity of bodhicitta. But bodhicitta develops completely, 100%, when the individual, the initiate, understands the nature of his own insof. Because everyone has his own insof. There is not here an excuse, oh, I cannot comprehend the insof because it's it's far away from me. No, it's inside of you. All of us are, are detached from it. Through meditation, we go, and little by little, we connect with that uh, end self, which is the aspect of the abstract space. By making that union, then the bodhisattva develops in that environment of the bodhicitta. You see that we say that the bodhisattva is somebody that has the solar bodies? No. Bodhisattva is somebody that is connected with the bodhicitta. And that bodhicitta develops here and now in us. The bodhisattva is Tifereth above and it has to be created as well. The bodhisattva is Moses. And that's why, uh, according to the book of Genesis, Jacob established himself in Yesod, the second initiation of major mysteries. And this is precisely where we find that uh, body that the Master Samael called the body of liberation, or the body of the Exodus, that we had to develop little by little. The auric embryo is called in Buddhism, that we need to develop with patience. 
in order to gain the title of Bodhisattva. And the clue in order to develop Bodhicitta is compassion. But this compassion develops in different levels. When the Bodhicitta is completely developed, when the consciousness is completely liberated, then the Bodhisattva is born inside. But for that, we need to work with three factors. In the tree of life, we understand that physically we are Malkut. And inside of this physicality, when we enter into initiation, into alchemy, then we start to develop our archetypes. And we have to develop all of the capacities of those archetypes within each one of us. But for that, we need the three factors. We always talk about the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. The first factor, according to Jesus, says, deny yourself. Jesus begins from the heart. Because bodhicitta means wisdom heart. And Jacob is Tifereth, and he is precisely there when the forces of the Lord descend in order to help the soul. As you see here, there are three chambers in the center column of the tree of life. Jesod is the first, Tifereth is the second, and Keter is the top. Only three chambers. That relates to our three brains. And that's why we state, when for the first time you enter into this knowledge and start practicing, you developed in the first triangle, which in this case is Yesod, Hod, and Netzach. Yesod is sex, Hod is the heart, and Netzach is the head. This is why Master Samael says we have to work with three factors. And that's why in the tree of life we see the three chambers or, or factors. The first chamber is Yasad, the second chamber is Tifereth, and the third chamber is Kater. In each level, we have to know how to place each triangle in our three brains in order to comprehend that. People enter into the first chamber right now and understand that in order to enter into the path, you have to initiate and be in chaste to take care of your sexual energy, which is your sad. But very few understand the second chamber, which is Tifereth, which is above your sad. That second chamber, which is Tifereth, is where Christ manifests the sun. Because alchemically and Kabbalistically, we know that the Holy Spirit, his kingdom, is in the sex, which is your son. The kingdom of Chokhmah, which is Christ the Son, is in the heart, Tifereth. And the kingdom of the Father, who is Keter, is in the head. So always we mention three brains. Intellectual brain, emotional brain, and sexual instinctual motor brain. Because we need to work with the three chambers. To deny the second chamber is to deny Christ, the Son. Is to deny the hierarchy. Because the hierarchy of the Lord, the Christ, comes from the superior world with the sixth dimension. That is Tifereth, the human soul. That's why uh, people that start in these studies, they are working individually in their own chastity, dealing with their own lust and working themselves with sexual alchemy. 
but they ignore that they need guidance. The only one that knows the level, knows the level in which you are, is that consciousness or cognizance that is called chokmah, Christ, is the one that gives the wisdom. So we need to receive that in order for the Lord to guide us as a members of the first chamber, meaning of the lower triangle. It's called the triangle of the priesthood. There you work. And then you need to rise to the second triangle. But to rise in the second triangle, you need to work a lot. Matthew Samael says, those that reach the 50% of the annihilation of the ego can enter into the second selection. But it's easy to see that the first selection relates to the beginners. The second selection to the companions. And the ones that are on top are the masters. You belong to the third selection. In order to enter into the second triangle at the second selection, we have to annihilate the ego. When people listen to that, it says, oh, my whole ego? No, just the ego that relates to Malkut, which is the ego of the 96 lusts that Kabbalistically is called Nahemad. In order to enter into the second triangle or the second selection, you need to receive a lot of help from the second chamber called the Eucharist. Because you have to receive Christ in your heart. Christ said, this is my bread. Or this is my body, receive it for your selection. And you enter and you eat the bread. This is my blood which is the wine. And through those mysteries, you place in your heart those atoms that will guide you in your particular individual path. Because your goal is to receive the Lord. But in order to receive the Lord, not as a Eucharist, but incarnated in you, well, you need to reach the first because that's the kingdom of the Lord, the heart. Initiatically, that's why Moses represents the first. And Moses was the son of a priest and a priestess from the tribe of Levi. Levi is Geburah. A daughter of Geburah, a daughter of Neshama, a daughter of Levi, says the Bible, had a son that was like godlike. It was Moses. He reads in the book of Exodus how Moses was born from those priests. But in order to reach that level, you have to work with the triangle of priesthood. And then Moses was, is going to be born. Master Samael talks very abundantly about the third initiation of major mysteries in his book, The Seven Words, and says that that initiation relates to uh, Joseph in combination with uh, uh, the last son of uh, Jacob who was uh, Benjamin. Benjamin, right? Yeah. So Benjamin and Jacob has a relationship between uh, uh, the third initiation in order to develop the astral solar body. And they enter with all of those archetypes into Mizrahim. But they need willpower in order to go out to return to that star that is the Ein Sof. And for that, they need Moses. 
most of the willpower that we start developing little by little. But most develop very well when we start controlling the mind, Netzach. Because that's precisely the sephira that we have to control. So Har states that Moses relates to Netzah because he is the only one that gets the victory against the Pharaoh, which is the mind. And he can guide and take all of the archetypes out of Malkut towards Tifereth and beyond. So in theosophy, Moses is the superior manas or abstract mind, which is the human soul, the causal body that controls the mind. And Aaron, his brother, is of course that mind that we need to create the solar mind that controls hod, the emotional body. So you see, you need to control your emotions with the mind, which is our own, the priest. But you need to be a priest in order to control the emotional center, hod. To be a priest, you need to be in chastity. You need to be, a, as the Bible said, a zadik, a chaste, a righteous. And then by developing that, you meet Moses. And between Aaron and Moses, they go out with all the archetypes towards Tifereth and beyond into the Mount Sinai. Which is this called the Exodus. The exodus for those that reach that level, of course. Let us go into this next graphic where we see, again, the 12 zodiacal signs and the man and the woman there together and are, of course, the archetypes of Israel that we are talking about here. And an exodus Chapter 12, verse 40 and 41 states, Now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Mizraim was 430 years. And it came to pass that at the end of the 430 years, even personally in that day, it came to pass that all the hosts of Jodhava went out from the land of Mizraim. Hosts of Yod Chava, or Yod He Bav He, in other words, which in the beginning we started and explained, that are all the archetypes of our own particular Yod He Bav He. We don't have to think like many people that think superficially, think that all oh, the Israelites were in Egypt 430 years in slavery, and finally they left into the promised land. No, that's not the meaning of it. We have to understand that time, esoterically speaking, relates to initiations. 100 years relate to the first initiation of major mysteries, Malkut. Second initiation of major mysteries, 200 years. Third initiation of major mysteries, Hod. 400 initiations, or 400, I mean, years, is Netzach, the mind. So you have to add 100 for Malkut, 100 for Yesod, 100 for Hod, and 100 for Netzach. That means that in order to enter into the Exodus, the second selection of the Exodus, you have to have 430 years. Now, this 30 relates to the 30th vertebra of your causal body, which is Moses. That Moses, or that willpower that we had to develop, 
how to reach the, the, the age of 130. And many people do not understand that until you read uh, what the Master Samael on the or writes in Christ Will, one of his books. He says, talking about the causal body, the creation of that Moses inside of us. The sacred fire has entered the 31st chamber of your spinal column. You have been submitted to all types of ordeals and have become victorious. That means controlling Netza, victory. Walk towards the Gnostic church carrying the child of your crucified will in your arms. Of course, he later explains in that book that in that 31st chamber, he confronts the guardian of Nirvana. And he decides to go into the direct path, means the Exodus and the second selection, or to go into Nirvana and forget about it. The 31st chamber means the vertebra, your spinal column, because that's precisely. We are not talking here about the physical body, the vital body, the astral body, or the mental body. We're talking about the causal body. People think that first you have to receive the initiation and then enter into the path, the direct or the spiral. And they are wrong because the path is taken in the 31st vertebra, before the initiation of Tiferes. If you take the direct path, then you receive the initiation of Tiferes, which is the fifth initiation, where you incarnate Christ. You see, incarnation of what we call the Son of God, or what the people call Jesus Christ. Because Jesus means Savior, and Christ is an energy. The mixture of Jesus Christ, or the Savior, or that energy, cosmic energy, with the human soul, make what Jesus called the Son of Man. And that Son of Man is the one that enters into the second selection of the Exodus. And this is how you see it. And you comprehend it when you study the doctrine. The Israelites were 430 years, and when they make the first step to the direct path, they are in, in 131. 431 years. And then they had to confront all of those words and battles that you read in Exodus and the rest of the book of Moses. Something psychological. It's not easy. The first step is very difficult to reach the second jungle, initiation. But after that, you have to work a lot. A friend of mine told me, well, but that's 430 years. If you make the addition Kabbalistically, Soon seven. And I say, oh yeah, of course. Are the seven serpents of fire that you have to have developed in your system, psychosomatic system. The seven serpents of fire. Why? Because the man is seven. Seven sephiroth. Chesed, Geburah, Tifereth, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. Those seven fires had to be developed, the seven Kundalinis. And this is how you enter into the second selection. Doesn't mean that you are ready, because you had to annihilate after that 
The eagles related with Nahemad, as I said, Nahemad, according to Kabbalah, is the mother of adultery and prostitution. To clean yourself psychologically with that is very difficult, especially in this day and age. Observe. Prostitution, porno. Pronea means prostitution. This humanity in this day and age, especially here in the United States, Canada, and Europe, are slaves of pornographic, means graphics of prostitutes, whether they are feminine or masculine. We cannot serve two lords, the devil and Christ. We have to dis de define ourselves and to disintegrate Nahema, which is adultery and fornication. But that's a task that is given to the ones that enter into the second selection. If you disintegrate that before entering into that second selection, very good. There is one that did it that I only know. Yogananda. He didn't create this, the internal bodies, but he advanced a lot to integrating the ego. And he has the bodhicitta developed. And if he enters into the path, the bodhisattva can develop in his environment, psychological environment, as a compassionate as he was. But he has to go beyond because it's not enough to develop that compassionate at the level of Yogananda. You have to go beyond, beyond that in order to become a bodhisattva. And of course, but it's a duty for the one that enters into the second selection to annihilate Nahemad within himself in order not to be a slave of Malkut because Malkut is Nahemad. This word Nahemad is written in the book of Genesis, states that Jehovah Elohim created trees that were, that were pleasant to the sight. Jehovah Elohim is a sexual force. All those trees that were created pleasant to the sight are you, me, your brother, your father, when they are young. Because when we are young, all the hormones in our physicality flourish. And we are attracted to the opposite sex naturally because of the sexual hormones. We have to conquer Nahemad, which is that forces of sexuality. And that's why Kabbalah says Nahemad is the mother of prostitution, adultery, and fornication. So we have to conquer that. Nobody enters into heaven by believing in Jesus. They have to conquer Nahemad in themselves. It doesn't mean that you are going to go and make a protest against porno pornography and against prostitution and against this adultery because a lot of people are enjoying that. They take that path, let it go to hell. They like it. But if we enter into this path, we have to fight against that. Not outside, inside, because we have it inside. What we see outside, we have it there abundantly. So we have to fight. And by fighting in this way, disintegrating Nahemad psychologically, we incarnate Abraham. We incarnate the inner most. We incarnate our own inner most spirit. Because Nahemad is annihilated. Because he said, the inner most, Abraham, relates to charity. And the contrary of charity is prostitution. Prostitutes deliver themselves to men or women for charity, for compassion, we will say, but in a negative manner, of course. We have to invert that and to give that energy to our innermost, which is Gesed, which is Abraham. 
And how are we going to give it if we have adultery and prostitution inside of us, egos of lust? We have to annihilate that. By annihilating those egos of 96 lusts, then we finally incarnate the spiritual soul, within which is Hesed. And then we say, this is our reincarnation, a master reincarnated. But he has to go now beyond. And he has to annihilate the egos of Lilith, which is something to work beyond a level. And only enter into that selection, you can, if you annihilate all the egos of Lilith, you reach 100%, the third selection in the Exodus. Read the book of Exodus, you will see how many that were walking there failed because of this, because of that. Because they do not understand that to work in the Exodus, which is the middle column of the Tree of Life, we need to work always with the three chambers. Yesod, Tifereth, and Kater. Many Gnostics despise Tifereth, and they think that they can go without the help of Christ. But we need the second chamber, we need the Eucharist, when we are not at the level of Moses. Because Christ is always the one that helps us internally. I remember experience that I had when I was meditated precisely in the second chamber, meaning in Tifereth, because those are related with those mysticism, with mystic rituals that are celebrated in any religion, related with the Eucharist. To comprehend how this force will help me to annihilate my ego. Talking about the second chamber, the Eucharist. In meditation, it came to me, the Divine Mother, surrounded completely with a blue light floating in the air. Such a beautiful experience seeing the Divine Mother from her heart glowing a blue light and expanding and covering completely her body. And then I understood that that is the second chamber. The blue light, the light of love that descends from Keter into Tifereth and guides the Kundalini because it is written that the fires of sex, called Kundalini, develop according to the fires of the heart. And in the heart is Christ, the breath. If you don't receive Christ, how are you going to develop those merits? In your Divine Mother, the Divine Mother was enveloped, imbibed by that blue light of Christ. And this is, I comprehend, what the second chamber is, what Tifereth is, to work with love. When we talk about compassion, bodhicitta, compassionate heart. When we talk about compassion, we talk about Christ. The Divine Mother is love. Love is love, but conscious love. So we have to receive that in many ways. Of course, the great goal is to receive the Lord in your heart, in Tifereth, when you reach the level of the second selection. Before that, you had to receive the Lord, that blue light of the heart, and you understand how internally you advance all the masters that walk on the path of compassion, glowed with that light, that blue light from the heart. And they always say, this is the second chamber. If you are, if you are clever and you understand the meaning, doesn't mean 
the second chamber in the internal plane, so in the physical plane, it means Tifereth, the second chamber of the path. Because first chamber is Yesod, the second chamber is Tifereth, and the third, of course, is the highest, where you deliver the doctrine, sacrifice for humanity, but you have to comprehend the doctrine in order to utter it through your head, through your mouth. This is how we comprehend the three chambers, the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness with the help of the heart. And this is how we advance. That's why the Master Samael says, I say to my hearts that it's better to enter the long path of bitterness and war I tell them that the logoic nirvanic spiral path offers us many paradises, but it is dangerous. Millions are the gods who are full of very serious karmic commitments. But this, of course, is uh, an advice the Master Samael is giving here to those that enter the second selection of the Exodus. For those that reach 430 years, psychologically, esoterically speaking. So remember that if eventually we enter into that, uh, into that level, then you will receive the title of Arhat. The Zohar, of course, explains in the creation of the world how uh, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, it is described alchemically, esoterically, what Abraham is. These are always related or translated from Hebrew into English as this is L. L means this. And Ella, the same letters, means goddess. So when you read these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, the Zohar says, Behivaram, by Abraham, they were created. And of course, this Abraham are, or is, I mean, Chesed. But remember that Abraham worked with Sarai, with all the archetypes of Israel, in order to generate. If you will change the word generation for initiations, then you will understand that those archetypes or generations of the heaven and the earth have to develop inside of you when they are created by Jehovah Elohim, because Jehovah Elohim is the power of God in the sex. And etc. They explain that that uh, this Abraham of Ehibaram symbolizes, of course, Hesed, the Sephira Hesed, mercy, which we already talk about. So you have within yourself that Abraham, that spirit, that mercy. If you deliver yourself to that interior being and you enter into the path, then will you develop the generations of the heavens and the earth within you, according to the book of Genesis. This is why the book of Zohar explains it. And uh, the book of Zohar explains very broadly about this uh, mystery that we are explaining you of the word Ele, which means this, these. But when these 
L o Ella is not united with the Holy Spirit, the only thing that we create is ego. That's why these are also the ego that we have. Or we will say these are the archetypes of Israel bottled up within lust, anger, pride, vanity, laziness, gluttony. And all of that that we have in abundance inside. We have to unite Ele with what we call Hu, the Holy Spirit, which is Yod M. If we unite that Yod M with Ele, we have the word Elohim. And this is how the Elohim develops inside of us in the Exodus. You have to accustom to place the three triangles of the tree of life always related with your three brains in order to understand the Exodus. Because a lot of speculation is if you see that that, that Exodus is between the waters, you understand the second day of Genesis when it is written, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, which is the, the, the column of, of the middle. That firmament of the middle of the tree of life is Yesod, Tifereth, Keter. That is the firmament that we had to develop, the three chambers. The midst of the waters, the waters of the male to the right, and the waters of the left, the woman. So let us make this, that firmament in the midst of the waters and separate the waters from the waters. This is a great work of alchemy that we had to do. But in order to understand that, we had to do the first day of Genesis. And God said, let there be light. Because we are in darkness. We don't see the path we don't see that the path is in the spinal column. We don't see that those waters relate to our fluids and our physicality. Why don't we see it? Because we are asleep. And always intellectualizing what we do not understand. If you apply always Genesis to your physicality, into your creation and initiations, then you will understand the Exodus which is the return into the light, which is above, beyond the third chamber, beyond your head, which is the Ein Sof. And this is how we find here in this graphic the three brains in which the way that they are developed. Matthew Samael says, the human being is corrupted because of pain, for pain is satanic. So no one can be liberated with pain. That pain, of course, is created because of our ignorance. Could be physical pain, emotional pain, or mental pain, psychological pain as well. Had to overcome that through initiation. And let us finish this lecture by talking about Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 15, 24, and 25, or 25. When the Moses is giving all of this doctrine to the people at that time and guiding them, it says, But it shall come to pass. If you will not hearken unto the voice of your Yod Havah Elohim, your inner particular God, to yourself to do all of his commandments and his statutes, which I give thee this day, that all of these maledictions shall overcome upon thee and overtake thee. Through karma, Yod Havah shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. 
From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed in Klippoth, which is the second death. In Sheol, Jehovah shall cause thee to be smitten before your egos, thine inner enemies. Yes, through the second death, thou shalt go out one way against them and free seven sinful ways before them. And thou shalt be dispersed back and forth into Malkut, the earth. We wrote here Le Sava, which is the word that Hebrew used for dispersion, and that is translated as diaspora. It meaning that the diaspora dispersion will continue if we don't do the work that we had to do and that we are teaching you in different lectures, then you will down. You will go down there to the infra dimensions of nature. Where nature will take care of you and only to clean your soul with pain, as it is written there in that. There is always two ways. The way of the tree of life and the way of death, which is the second death. Matthew Samael wrote more than 70 books in order to guide us into the Exodus. But we have to understand that Samael is the Logos of Mars. Is that Logos that controls Geburah? Neshama. And we have to receive his strength in different levels. The first chamber, which is this chamber in which you receive his doctrine. The second chamber, where you receive uh, the energy of his logos through the Eucharist, because he is a logos. And the third chamber, which is precisely a guidance for those that are annihilating the ego and that wants to reach that level after entering into the second selection. A study of the books of the Master, you will find how symbolically he is always teaching you how to walk out of slavery into your own freedom, spiritually speaking. And don't fall into the mistake of inter interpreting that physically, but psychologically. I can say more about that exodus, but they're indicating me this is enough. Because people need to learn that by themselves in order to be selected. At least with this lecture, you are selected in the first chamber. If you continue, you need to do all the work of Genesis in order to enter into the second selection, which is Exodus. Because the Israelites left Egypt at the age of 430 years. And that is esoterically the fourth initiation of mere mysteries and the 30th vertebra of the causal body. Do you have questions? Two paths, you have to be in the second selection in order to choose those paths. But you can prepare yourself because the Master Samael on Veor explains that if you develop the bodhicitta beforehand, that bodhicitta will create the environment for the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva is a causal body. And that bodhisattva can work through the bodhicitta. But Master Samael says, if the Bodhisattva is in the second triangle, of course, and wants to do uh, compassion for humanity, but if the earthly man with his consciousness here in this physical world is asleep, he doesn't know anything, 
he is sleeping and, and he is just wondering which way I am, which path I am. Of course, you cannot choose. So we have to awake first. The awakening of the consciousness is to the, the development of the bodhicitta. And uh, if we already have the solar bodies, even better. But if you have the solar bodies and you don't develop the bodhicitta, you cannot enter into the second selection because you belong always to the first. You have to annihilate ne nahemad, adultery, prostitution, fornication, which is very common in this day and age for all of us. Well, remember, that is not the personality that the do the decision. It's the soul. And the soul has to be in the initiation, has to be in contact with his own particular Abraham, his own particular inner most. And from the inner most comes always those longings. And you have that longing, even if you are asleep, it's because your inner most wants to take that compassionate path. So why does he have to encourage people to take that path? Is it, is it not up to them? Well, because he is on the direct path. Obviously, he encourages because he's the best. But so he, he, it doesn't say you have forcibly to take it. If you want to take it, you take it. But if you don't want it, there are many initiatives that reach the level of Tifereth, and they don't go into the direct path. This is called Buddha's Pratyekas. Of course, talking to the arhats. Are we in the level of arhat? When we reach the level of arhat, then you will know, and then you will read that again. Oh, he's talking to me. He's advising me to take the direct path. So but there are many, uh, many initials arhats that read that, and they said, no, I will take the spiral, and they take, go to the spiral. So, uh, human spirit can be convinced by logos or another great master? Oh, yeah. The logos, in this case, the Bodhisattva, the Master Samael, was always making a big revolution in Nirvana. And talking with all of those Nirvanis, saying, abandon this. Come and take the direct path. And he knew that they could do it. But they were listening to him. And there was always a great revolution in Nirvana because of the Master Samael trying to advise them to take the direct path. Because there are millions and millions of Nirvanis that are in the spiral path. And this is very dangerous because they can fall easily with the ego alive. And you're saying serious? The soul of serious is the nirvana? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's another thing. But we don't have to enter into that because that uh, is the path. Uh, in the great path, uh, uh, you have to be always very well balanced. When you developed in the direct path, you develop also omnipotency. And if you don't overcome that, you get stagnant as a god. There are many levels. But uh, at least if you want to enter into that level of knowing why the God serious doesn't enter into the absolute, you have to enter into the second triangle, into the second level, second selection, in order to understand that. Before that, it's just a speculation. Because all of us are in the first chamber. First level. Yes? This always talks about the, these 98 curses from the, the book of Deuteronomy here, that they are really blessings that are given. How can we turn these curses? By another in the ego. Yeah, obviously, uh, there are many blessings given by the Logos. The if you enter into, if you enter into the path, if you don't care and you start interpreting that in the wrong way and you keep your life of fornication, adultery, and just believing in what is written but not doing anything about it, of course you eventually uh, fall into glipoth and those blessings turn into 
curses. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, of course, lack of faith. Because uh, the Red Sea symbolizes the passion of waters, of sexuality. Moses is capable of dividing those waters. So if you are in the path, on the path, and you said, it's so difficult because I am so lustful. I see my lust inside of me. How am I going to go on to the other side? Well... Take faith, take faith in your willpower because your willpower is connected with God. And he will divide those waters, filthy waters, from the pure waters. And, and then you go straight in your spinal column up to the second level, the second selection. That's a great work by meditating, of course, in your lust. It's not by believing or because I believe in what Moses wrote, or because I believe in what Samael wrote. No. You have to do that psychologically. Separate the waters from the waters in order to create the firmament in the middle. And that's a great alchemical work that needs patience. Because nobody is born spiritually just by slapping the fingers. Yes? Again, your question is? Is it, is it ever desirable to descend into the world and to explore the levels of the people? Well, you descend into the world of Lipot by desire. You have to overcome desire in order not to fall in it. Even if you don't want to fall, if you have the ego alive, you fall in it. This humanity in this moment is in Lipot, psychologically speaking. In the surface of the earth, we see that everything, everybody is worshipping Klipov, hell. They are worshipping violence against nature, sexually speaking. Worshipping homosexuality, lesbianism. And if you talk against that, you are a prejudice. Because they like hell. So what can we do when we see that all humanity is going down? Like in a big uh, Niagara Falls down. You want to pick, you want to be helped? Well, this is the lecture here. You have to help yourself. Because all the millions of inhabitants of the earth are going down. And the only way to go out is by entering to the initiation, entering to the path, into the three selections. But we will say it better, into the first selection. Because only being in the first election, you can say, oh, I will be in the second by working very hard. But right now, everybody's in the first election. And that is initiation into the major mysteries and minor mysteries too. Well, psychologically speaking, esoterically speaking, to enter into the first election means to elevate your yad, your shakti potential of your sexual force. When you do that, in combination with the annihilation of the ego, you start seeing how the light starts developing in you. And then you are seeing things in relation with your development. And you start seeing that this is very hard, as many, many students say, this is very hard. Before I entered into these studies, I didn't see too much evil. Now I see more evil. But that evil is inside of them. They were not aware of that. And now that they are fighting against that, they're developing, they see that there is a lot to do. But they are not alone. Everybody is in the same level. We have to work. 
and by developing the light, because the light that we need to develop is in the sexual energy. That's the yad. You see? That's why the letter Zadi explains that very well here in the sexual organs. The letter Zadi is a letter Nun, which means fish. But it's like this, bent, you see? Nun, but when you bend that, that means that you are allowing the yad to go in your spine, up to your head. And in order for that yad, which is the Shakti potential of the absolute, the solar absolute, to go up in your spine, you need merits of your heart. You need to work a lot in your ego and to pray to your inner God and do the transmutation, sexual transmutation, every day in order to develop that. And eventually, you will see how that light will develop your chakras, your soul, your psyche, and you will see your inner advanced, advancement inside of you. You can also say that uh, willpower can, you know, in a circular way, can be yeah. stronger and stronger and your love for humanity can be... Exactly. Do you see how Moses descends from Mount Sinai into Mizraim, Egypt, and start telling all the archetypes, hey, we are going to work against Pharaoh, the mind. You work and pray, right? But he goes into, into Egypt, into Mizraim, to help the people. The same thing we have to do, to go into our physical body and to liberate those archetypes, right? With willpower, because this is what Moses is, willpower. But in the beginning, our Moses is just a baby. And be careful, because if the Pharaoh knows that you are developing Moses, your Moses can be killed. Remember, Jesus also escaped in order not to be destroyed. This is something internal. Jesus of Nazareth, or as the Bible says, the Kabbalists, is not Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus of Maseroth. Maseroth is a zodiacal belt, the 12 tribes, the archetypes. The 12 archetypes have the center, who is Yeshua, the Savior. Jesus of Maseroth or Jesus of Nazareth, same thing. Because Nazareth, the, the town of Nazareth, didn't exist when Jesus was alive. But Maseroth, yeah, zodiacal belt was there. Or Nazareth, if you want. This is your question? The higher initiations are eight in relation with the erect path. Eight. And the minor are nine, which are related to Klippoth. You see, as you know, we are slaves of Klippoth. This is beneath the earth, the nine layers, psychologically speaking. So we need to enter into our own psyche, subconsciousness, unconsciousness, and start knowing and developing the nine initiations, little by little. Comprehending your own self in relation with Malkut. And of course, little by little, as a single person, you enter into the nine initiations of minor mysteries. But as a married person, if you work with your Yad in the sexual magic, you advance faster and enter into the mayor initiations, yes? There's an ordeal of the diarine, is that for the minor or for the major? The ordeal of diarine is, uh, it happens in all, in all levels. Master Samael only explains that briefly, but if he explains that that ordeal has to be, has to be passed in, in different levels, he has to write every time or a great book Master Samael wrote in synthesis. So what we read about the Darwin ordeal is related with many levels, not only one. When he talks about the four ordeals of fire, water, earth, and air, it's in relation with all the levels. But he wrote only one time in order for, to give the guidance. Yes? Um, so the, the eight higher initiations, what do they correspond to? 
the eight higher initiations relates to the lower sephiroth. Let's see here, the tree of life is here. First initiation, second, third is Hod, Netzai is fourth, Tifereth is fifth, six is Gebura, seven is Hesed, and the eight is Bina, which is what connects us to the Logos. The eighth initiation, the initiate resurrects and enters into the world of Bina. And as resurrected, he goes into the third mountain. Do not mistake the three mountains that the Master Samael wrote a book about it with these three steps are different. The three steps are related until Bina. Beyond that is a mountain of ascension only for resurrected masters. You always are an individual, but with universal perception. Do you know what is that? That you understand the multiplicity within the unity and the unity within the multiplicity, the whole universe. You are a sacred individual. That means that you are not selfish. Because selfishness means that you are just encapsulated in yourself and don't go beyond or do not perceive beyond your individuality. But sacred individuality means that your perception, your consciousness expand within you towards the outside, within, without, into the ends of and into the abstract, absolute space. That is to be an individual with a consciousness, which is called para Marta Satya. An individual with absolute consciousness is an individual, but perceives a lot. Yeah. Well, of course, the, if you read the Gospels, you will see that after resurrection, Master Jesus uh, remains with his disciples, his apostles showing them the mysteries of resurrection. And later on, he ascended. That's called the ascension towards heaven when he was lost completely because it's beyond. It's, the ascension begins in the triangle of Keter, Chokma, Bina, in with Chokma and goes into the absolute. That's beyond. That's called the third mountain, mountain of ascension. But the Mountain of initiation and resurrection are the two steps towards Bina. Yeah? Well, when you enter into the Exodus, you discover many things related with your soul, your spirit. You mean in Earth, that you enter in a specific, uh, what, place? You mean in the first selection or second selection or third selection? Second. The second. Matthew Samael on verse says, the one that entered into the second selection will be in the island of the Exodus. And I am not going to talk about that mystery because you are not allowed to comprehend it. And that is very dangerous to talk about the island of the Exodus. Dangerous in the, in the meaning that we explain, I know what is this, but if I explain it, in one week, one month, everybody will appear in the internet. I am in the island of the Exodus because I know that this isn't that. So I said, no. <laughs> Much as I never explain, I never explain it too. Yeah. But if you study this lecture, 
and work in it, you will figure it out. If you figure it out. Yes? Yeah, the, the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives is just an initiation of major mysteries and how that descends into Malkut in order to acquire experience and to return after that into the absolute. After, of course, experiencing the exile, that's the exile or the diaspora down to Malkut. Exodus is when you start in the initiation and you go up again, back into the Ensaf. And of course, Abraham is Chesed, Isaac is Geburah, and Jacob is Tifereth. And we are here in Malkut. If we want to know those mysteries, we have to enter into the first election to be alchemists. Otherwise, this is, you know, theoretically, you may maybe understand and have a hunch, but in order to experience that, you have to walk on the path to be an alchemist. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.